come here, come say hi. Haven't even started talking and Lily is like, oh, they're back. Hello, best friends and welcome back. I hope your week is going well and that life is going well and that you are going well. And it's so nice to be hanging out with you again in our safe little space that we've created here. If you are new here though, and you have never seen my face before, then hello, my name is Liz. It's so lovely to meet you. And if you like talking about things like true crime and unsolved mysteries, then you should definitely hit subscribe so that you and me can be best friends forever. You know, cause that sounds like fun, right? Just so you know, we're best friends now. Also, if you're new here, I usually don't talk this quickly, but this is my third coffee of the day. It's just been one of those weeks. Firstly, my whole family has been sick for what seems like decades now. And secondly, my computer decided that it doesn't like me anymore and deleted over half of the write-up that I had for today's case, literally just as I finished it. But silver lining, I'm even more well-versed in the case now than I was before. So basically my computer can suck it. If you follow me over on Instagram, you might already be aware that I got to do this really fun thing this week though, with two really lovely people called Emily and Martin on their amazing podcast, Style Femme for Murder. If you are interested in hearing more about that, then make sure you stay tuned to the end of this video where I'll give you all the deets and we can all listen to me awkwardly stumble through my first ever podcast and we can all cringe. It'll be fun. But of course, we are joined by the real star of the show today, Lily Girl, here to give us top-notch emotional support and a whole bunch of visual and audio disturbances for me to try and navigate through later when I'm editing this video. As far as she's concerned, that's her whole job. So editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cab. Lily Girl, you got enough cushions today? Have you got too many cushions? <laughs> Today we have an Australian case and not just any Australian case really because this one took place in Western Australia, my home state where I've lived in my entire 34 years of life. So you should know that every time we talk about a town or a city, chances are I've been there or even lived there at some point in my life and every time it's like a punch in the freaking guts. It all feels very personal. But at the same time, while a lot of this did occur in WA, it's also quite an international case. It's a bit all over the place. There's a lot of people involved. It's messy. It's very strange. And it's been unsolved for about 14 years now. But even though it is unsolved, as we're going through the details, there's likely going to be an explanation that stands out to you as what obviously happened. I know that was the case for me originally, but trust me, the deeper we go down the rabbit hole today, the wilder things get, and you are going to be second guessing everything. Today, we're going to be talking about this group of people made up by 45-year-old Simon Cadwell, 40-year-old Tony Popich, 27-year-old Chantelle McDougall, and six-year-old Leela McDougall. And we're talking about them because in July of 2007, they all just straight up disappeared off the face of the earth and no one knows what happened to them. So obviously, even from the very little amount you know so far, we have an interesting group of people that probably have as you're wondering who is who to who. And the basic rundown is that Simon and Chantel were a couple, Leela was their daughter, and Tony was their close family friend. And in 2007, they all lived together on a property they were renting in a small rural town called Nanup in Western Australia. On this property, Simon, Chantel, and Leela all lived in a farmhouse together, and Tony lived in a caravan that was kept on the property. And just so that we're all on the same page. Whenever I talk about the group in this video, these are the four people I'm talking about. To give you a general idea of what Nanup is like, as someone that has done their, you know, fair share of weekends away and road trips in Western Australia, Nanup is one of those towns that you drive through on your way to where you're really going. Like you might stop for coffee or to fill up your car, but then you move on because there's not a whole lot happening there. Sorry to anyone from Nanup that's watching right now and just feeling very offended. I swear I'm not throwing shade at Nanup. It's definitely beautiful. It's got that quiet, 
peaceful, relaxed vibe that a lot of small Australian towns have. And back in 2007, when the group moved there, it had a teensy tiny population of about 500 people. So not exactly a bustling little hotspot or anything, but that's exactly what drew Simon, Chantel and Tony there in the first place. The group moved to Nanup in November 2003 and Chantel being a really bubbly, happy person just instantly fit in with the locals and made a lot of friends. And even though the property they were renting was actually just outside of Nanup, Chantel was always in town going to exercise classes and taking Leela to playgroup and also swimming and karate lessons. For work, Chantel was a swimming teacher. She also worked at the fish and chip shop in town, also waitressed at the Nanup Hotel in town. She also also sold makeup from home and was a seamstress making dresses at home as well. And she raised chickens and sold their excess eggs. So Chantel was basically like a serious hustler. Meanwhile, Tony, who was known as like Chantel's best friend, also very quickly became a well-liked and well-known member of the community. And he was quoted by one of the townspeople to be known as like a beautiful, gentle dude. Tony worked for a couple of years in the local hardware store in Nanup and also in an orchard, which is work he was probably drawn towards because his family had a fruit business that he had worked for in the past. And Tony also just loved nature and being in the outdoors. Tony's brother said that he felt like Tony had suffered bouts of depression and just kind of a general lack of direction in life, but quite universally, Tony was seen as just this really lovely, relaxed guy. And Leela was a very happy, very energetic little girl, pretty much Chantel's mini me. And she loved karate and dancing. Like there's quite a few home videos of her online and in them she is always dancing. And she was also a social butterfly like her mom. Chantel was said to be an amazing mother to Leela. Like on top of all of that hustling she was doing, she was also Leela's primary caregiver and she was homeschooling her. I know, right? Like did Chantel just not sleep? I don't get it either. But this now brings us to Simon, because while Chantel was working her butt off at multiple jobs and raising and homeschooling Leela, Simon was unemployed and would spend the majority of his days sleeping because he was up all night online in front of his computer. But even though he didn't technically work um, online, Simon was kind of a big deal. He was the founder and leader of a religious group he had created called the Truth Fellowship. And he had also written multiple books, including Servers of the Divine Plan and The New Call. And he had about 50 followers from all around the world. And I know 50 followers doesn't sound like a whole lot, but we are talking the early 2000s here, not 2021. And we're also not talking about some baddie Instagram model posting aesthetically pleasing selfies. We're talking about a man who was selling his teachings about the earth coming to the end of a 75,000 year cycle and the end of this boring three-dimensional plane that we're all stuck on right now and moving on to a vibrating five-dimensional plane. Mm -hmm. Oh, does that sound interesting? Mm -hmm. Would you have bought Simon's book? I reckon Lily would have brought Simon's book, guys. But Simon said that only, <laughs> Simon said, but Simon said that only some people were going to experience this shift or this ascension, namely his followers who were called servers. And to be a server, you had to be willing to give up your ego and all your personal desires for the greater collective good of the entire world. As well as all of this, there was just the general underlying theme of like an army Armageddon or a doomsday that was just looming over humanity. And if his followers were good and obeyed his teachings, then they would all get to ascend to the next plane and kind of all hang out and party together. While everyone that wasn't equipped to move on to the next plane would just be reincarnated over and over again to suffer in this crappy three-dimensional plane that we're stuck in now. So considering all of that, I mean, 
50 followers was pretty good. But while Simon was doing pretty well online with his religious teachings and his forums and his books, as you can imagine, this didn't really translate well in the real world. Chantel's parents, Jim and Kathy McDougall, who lived in Victoria but were in regular contact with Chantel and Leela and had visited the group multiple times in Nana, said that Simon was very odd to say the least. Uh, Kathy said that there was one day when they all went out for lunch to a winery and after Simon had had a couple of drinks, he turned to her and with a completely straight face and not joking at all, asked her what planet she was from and then went on to tell her that her daughter, Chantel, had travelled to Earth from a different world. Simon disapproved of Chantel staying in contact with her parents. Like, I think he saw them as these people that he preached about that weren't equipped to move on to the next plane. And he also told Chantel that they would poison Leela's mind with their worldliness. But despite how obedient Chantel was to Simon, Cutting off ties with her parents was something that she refused to do. So Simon made Jim and Kathy very uncomfortable and they weren't thrilled about his relationship with their daughter, but they managed to tolerate him for Chantel and Leela's sake. And this was kind of the same approach as the people in Nanup. Like everyone really liked Chantel and Tony and Leela, but Simon, on the other hand, kind of creeped everyone out. And Simon didn't help matters by doing things like sitting outside Chantel's work, like at the hotel while she was waitressing, for hours watching her to make sure that she didn't interact with any people that he deemed as undesirable. Also on the rare occasion they were seen together in public, Simon was always really controlling and Chantel wasn't her usual happy, bubbly self, but instead really quiet and submissive. Like whenever they were walking, Chantel would always walk behind Simon, never in front or beside him. But in the end, no one had ever seen Simon hurt anyone. He had never been physically abusive to Chantel or Leela. In fact, he was really loving and doting dad to Leela. So everyone just kind of let him be. And the group ended up staying there in Nanup for four years. And then in April 2007, the owners of the property they were renting decided that they wanted to subdivide and arrange to have a transformer installed out the front of the house. And Simon was not happy about this transformer. When the contractor rocked up to start the process of putting the transformer up, Simon stormed out in this rage and went off on him about the electromagnetic field or the EMF that the transformer was putting out and how it was making him and the rest of the group sick. And this contractor said that not only was Simon very very visibly angry and stressed, he had red hives just covering his neck and face. And he tried to explain to Simon that the EMF from all of the appliances in the house was way more intense than what this transformer would ever put out, but Simon just would not listen. The contractor had to go out three more times to the house to complete the installation. And each time Simon got more enraged and more erratic, like he even resorted to burying magnets in the yard around around the house, believing that this would divert the rays of EMF away from the house. But then the last time this contractor was at the house, something seemed to have shifted. Rather than Simon coming out and yelling at him about the EMF from the transformer, Simon was relaxed and friendly. He even brought him a beer and just chatted happily about life in general. So from the outside, Things seem to be all good all of a sudden, but in actuality, we're now coming up to the events that led to the group's disappearance. Around this time, Chantel's parents, Jim and Kathy, visited the group in Nanup again. And while they were there, a package came. And when Chantel opened it, it was a passport for Leela. So they, of course, asked, oh, are you guys going on a holiday somewhere? And Simon suddenly was just very hush-hush. He snatched the passport away out of their view and rushed it upstairs. And so Jim and Kathy just looked at Chantel like, 
what the hell just happened? But Chantel was really evasive and just quickly changed the subject to avoid answering any of their questions. But in a week or so, when they were back home in Victoria, Jim and Kathy got a phone call from Chantel, who really excitedly told them that the group was going to move to Brazil, specifically to a commune on the outskirts of Rio Branco to do charity work. In fact, Simon was already over there organizing everything and Chantel, Tony and Leela were going to join him literally within the next few days. This news, of course, filled Jim and Kathy with like immense amounts of worry, like it would any parent, but they didn't want to rain on Chantel's parade. They didn't want to burden her. So they instead made her promise to stay in contact and to send them a letter as soon as they arrived so that they would know that Chantel and Leela were safe. And then they said goodbye. While Chantel was telling her parents about the group's travel plans, Tony traveled to a town called Manjima to break the news to his family that he was going to Brazil and they likely weren't going to be seeing him anytime soon. And during the same trip, he sold his ute for $1,500 without bargaining, like he just wanted it gone. On the 13th of July, 2007, Chantel also sold her car for $4,000 to a car dealership in Bustleton. And she and Leela also sold sold three puppies to the pet shop in town, Dachshunds they were, from Chantel's two prized Dachshunds that she had at home. And yes, I did have to look up how to pronounce Dachshund because it turns out my whole life I've been pronouncing it wrong. I've been saying Dachshund like a total idiot. So my bad. Sorry, Dachshunds everywhere. Anyway, after leaving the pet shop, Chantel then went and banked the check from the car and cashed the check from the puppies. And the same day, Tony went to the Bustleton courthouse to arrange paperwork to give his brother the power of attorney over his estate so that his brother would have full control over all of his finances. The next day, the 14th of July, a woman named Carolyn French traveled from Perth to Nanup to buy Chantel's two much-loved Dachshunds, like the mum and dad of the three puppies she had sold to the pet shop. And the money from this exchange exchange was put into her account along with the money she had from selling her car and this proved to be the last ever sighting of Chantel. Two days later when the group's landlords went to the property to tend to their cattle they were very surprised to find that it seemed like the group had just packed up and left with no notice and sure enough when they were looking around they found an envelope on the back door with a note from Chantel letting them know that they had gone to Brazil. In this note which was in Chantel's handwriting she apologized that the group had left on such short notice but she said that they had been suffering lack of sleep caused by the EMF put out by the transformer and she said that they had cut off the utilities you know like the electric the gas the phone line and that the furniture left in the house was theirs to do with as they wished the owners found a similar note from tony in his caravan letting them know that they were also welcome to any of the items that he had left behind and politely letting them know the condition of the caravan and how they could carry out any repairs necessary when the owners went inside the house they found it basically spotless. All the food had been taken out except for a bucket of rice. The fridge was clean. All of the group's personal items like clothing, etc., had been cleared out except for Chantel's wallet, which was left on the kitchen bench. But strangely, as well as leaving behind all their furniture, the group had also left behind all of their electronics, including a large plasma TV, Xboxes, a DVD player, and two computers. For months after the group left, Chantel's parents, Jim and Kathy, nervously checked their letterbox every day, waiting for that letter from Chantel to let them know that she and Leela had arrived safely in Brazil. But nothing ever came and they were getting increasingly concerned. Like we said, Simon had in the past tried to get Chantel to cut off contact with them, but she had always refused. It didn't make sense for her to suddenly give in now unless of course it had been involuntary. So with images running through their minds of Chantel and Leila being held captive somewhere in the Amazon, Jim and Kathy contacted the Australian embassy in Brazil to share their concerns and ask if maybe the embassy could locate Chantel and Leila. And the embassy's super helpful response was that 
Brazil was a big country and Chantel and Leela would be hard to find. So they then contacted immigration, who informed them that after looking through surveillance footage at the airport, they had come to the conclusion that Simon, Chantel and Leela had never even left Australia. So in October 2007, three months after they had last heard from their daughter and granddaughter, Jim and Kathy reported Chantel and Leela as missing. And Tony's brother followed suit not much later and reported Tony as missing as well. And the initial investigation into the group's disappearance took off at a bit of a slow pace because police couldn't really see any reason to be alarmed. You know, the group had told pretty much everyone they knew that they were going to Brazil. They had packed up their belongings. They had cut off the utilities, sold their cars, their dogs, even left a note. So investigators didn't bother carrying out a forensic examination of the property in Nanup because at the time they just felt there wasn't enough evidence to suggest that the group had been victims of a crime. In fact, there would never be a forensic examination carried out at the property because by the time investigators realized that there actually was reason for concern, it was too late. Any evidence that might have been there would have been long gone or contaminated by the new tenants living in the house. But the further they looked into the group's disappearance, the more investigators found to make them realize that things definitely went right here. Like, as well as immigration not being able to find footage of the group at the airport, none of their names came up on any immigration records as ever having left the country by air or sea. And despite Chantel going to all that effort of selling her car and the dogs, her bank account, which had a balance of about $6,000, hadn't been accessed once in the months since the group went missing. But it wasn't until two years into the investigation when police turned their attention to the UK, where Simon was originally from, that they realized that Simon wasn't Simon. <laughs> Simon Cadwell was actually Gary Felton, and Gary Felton had stolen the identity of one of his colleagues back in the UK decades ago, like in the 1980s. So obviously we need to do some serious rewinding and unpacking on Simon right now because what is even going on? But just so that we're all on the same page, even though we know now that Simon was actually Gary, we're still going to call him Simon because that's what everyone knew him as, including the freaking mother of his child, Chantel. So Simon was actually born Gary Felton on the 15th of January, 1962 in England. And we don't know a whole lot about his early life. We do know that his medical history included some kind of back ailment or injury, which was resulted in quite a bit of pain and slight lack of mobility. But the story he told Chantel when they first met was that he had been a bodybuilder, but had had to give it up when he broke his back twice. In 1986, when Simon was 24 years old and had already been convicted twice for fraud, he met the real Simon Catwell when they were both working at the same software company in England. And for reasons unknown to us, the fake Simon decided to steal the real Simon birth certificate. He used that to obtain a British passport and then left the UK and just straight up took on Simon's identity. Simon then did like a whole bunch of traveling all around the world. And then he met a woman in India named Deborah Fleischer and became romantically involved with her. And they did a little bit more traveling before the two of them settled down in Melbourne, Australia, and had a son together in 1997. It was around this time that Simon authored his books that that we mentioned earlier, and he actually published his books anonymously, saying that he didn't want the readers to be distracted by the author's name or who he was, but we all know now that it was more likely it was because he was living under a stolen identity and he knew that publishing a book under the name Simon Cadwell was just a surefire way to get caught out. Yeah, he knew he'd get caught out, didn't he? Simon's too sneaky for us. You just want cuddles, hey? Okay? You just want cuddles all the time. This was also when Simon created his website, The Truth Fellowship, made up by forums where he would 
teach his beliefs and encourage people to follow him. And this was how Simon survived. He had literally no paid employment in the time since he left the UK, instead relying solely on profits from his books and charity from his followers. It was also in 1997 that Simon, who was 35 years old by this point, met the 17-year-old Chantel when she and her partner at the time, Simon Cookerman, attended a seminar that Simon was presenting in Melbourne. And yes, we have two Simons now. So we are going to call Chantel's partner Cookerman because there's really only room for one Simon in this story. Anyway, Chantel and Cookerman clearly bought into Simon's teachings just hook, line and sinker because within a year of meeting him, they moved in with Simon and Deborah and the couple's son. And not long after this, they were joined by another woman named Justine Smith, who had also read one of Simon's books and was also fully on board. So I know there's more people to keep track of here. It's probably getting a little bit confusing, but trust me, guys. We've got this. Justine Smith actually accompanied Simon on a trip to the UK that he told her was to reconcile with his mother who had abused him as a child. But the real reason for this trip was that Simon's publishers in Australia had realized that Simon's books were basically a big plagiarized mishmash of the teachings of other religious gurus and leaders, and they wanted their money back. So Simon wanted to go and lay low in the UK for a little while to avoid them. When Justine met Simon's family, she of course thought it was super weird that they all called him Gary, but when she asked him about it, he fed her this really vague story about how he had had this friend in high school who was adopted and took on a different name. And he had given Simon the documents for the other name, which he then took on because he had, quote, done some bad things. Meanwhile, back in Australia, Chantel split up with Cookerman and then went and met up with Simon and Justine in the UK before all three of them came back to Australia. And along with Deborah and Deborah and Simon's son, they all moved into the same house, this time in Perth, Western Australia. And things in this living situation started off innocently enough. Um, Chantel was the nanny to Deborah and Simon's son, but then things turned into this weird harem situation between Simon and the three women where he was having sex with all of them at the same time. And again, Simon wasn't working. He was living off the salaries of the three women who were all working. I trust I'm not the only one getting like creepy Keith Raniere vibes right now. Like I swear cult leaders are all exactly the same. Tony also moved into the house at this point, having met Chantel a few years earlier through mutual friends, but it was a kind of similar setup to what the group had in Nanup, where Tony didn't actually live in the house. He lived in a tent in the backyard, even though there were rooms available inside. In 2000, Chantel became pregnant to Simon with Leela, and she told a friend later in Nanup that she had never intended on having children, but in the time leading up to when she conceived, the name Leela kept popping into her mind and it was as though Leela wanted to be born and it was Chantel's destiny to have her. By 2003, both Deborah Fleischer, the mother of Simon's son, and Justine Smith had moved on from Simon and the rest of the group. So with nothing really holding them in Perth, the group first moved to a small rural town in Western Australia called Denmark for a short period of time and then moved on to Nanup. And I imagine Imagine what I said at the beginning of the video about the group being drawn to Nanup because it was quiet and isolated probably makes a bit more sense now. They were looking for somewhere out of mainstream society to be able to practice Simon's alternative teachings in peace. And it's now that we get to the darker side of Simon's teachings. To jog your memory a little bit, Simon preached to his followers that his servers would all join him in the very immediate future in ascending to this five-dimensional plane that was going to be bigger and brighter than this boring old three-dimensional plane that we're all stuck on right now. The problem was that ascending seemed to be synonymous with dying, specifically by ending your own life. And according to Simon, the whole thinking was, um, you know, why wait around on this plane when you could 
end things now and move on to the next plane. Like, let's just get this show on the road. And just so you know, I probably will be using the words ascension and ascending a lot in the place of the word suicide for the rest of this video, because it is the term that the Truth Fellowship used. And as per the disclaimer at the start of this video, it's a very strong theme in this case. So ascending and ascension it is. So it was in May 2007 that Simon first told one of his followers via email about this very disturbing plan. He said the group had to wander into the bush and then ascend together. And he said they were going to use the drug Nembutol, which is a prescription drug used to treat insomnia. But it's quite well known that in large doses, this drug will cause death. According to Simon, the plan was that he, Chantel and Leela would take the drug first. And once they had died, Tony would bury their bodies and then take the drug himself and wander even further into the bush to somewhere it was unlikely that his body would ever be found. So this follower, even though she totally subscribed to Simon's teachings on ascension and all that, she was horrified and she told Simon it would be murder to include the six-year-old Leela in this plan of his. And she instead tried to convince him to move to Brazil to this group she had found called the Santo Diem Church. And Simon's response was, yeah, he didn't think Chantel could go through with the plan either because she felt the same way. It would be murder to kill Leela that way. And he also said that he would need months of therapy to make that trip to Brazil. And I'm not sure if he meant physical physical therapy because I know his back was causing him a lot of pain or if he meant psychiatric therapy because he was very open with the fact that he was severely depressed at this point and he told multiple people that he was on strong antipsychotic medication. Simon made his last post ever on the Truth Fellowship forums in June of 2007 and it read, I'm exhausted and the only option left is to leave this world. So Understandably, this caused a bit of commotion amongst his followers and a rumor was started that he had actually ascended. And this was like a whole month before Chantel, Tony and Leela went missing. But when a man living in Nanup who knew the group, who was also a religious guru who had written his own books, when he contacted Chantel to ask her about the rumor, she would neither confirm or deny if Simon was dead or alive. All she would say was, oh, is that what they said? Spoiler alert, Simon was still alive at this point, and he had been in contact via email with the woman I mentioned earlier, Carolyn French, who traveled on the 14th of July from Perth to Nanup to buy Chantel's two Dachshunds. And Carolyn had some very interesting things to say to police about this encounter. She said that once the sale had been sorted out and Chantel had given her all the things that she needed for the dogs, like their paperwork, their beds, their favorite toys, all of that, she got the impression that Chantel was trying to rush her out of the house, but she stopped and asked Chantel if Leela would like to say goodbye to the dogs. And Chantel acted really strangely. She told Carolyn that Leela was in the caravan with Tony and that she was ill. But she then left Carolyn and went to a room in the house that was pretty much in the opposite direction of the caravan. And when she came back out, she was all anxious and told Carolyn that she might need to take Leela to hospital. So investigators listening to this were wondering who was in that room. Was it Simon? Because Chantel had already told her parents by this point that Simon was in Brazil sorting everything out for the move. Carolyn also said that she had tried calling Chantel the next day and she hadn't gotten through so she'd left a voice message on her answering machine and she had never heard back from Chantel but a day or two later she got a phone call from quite an angry sounding woman who was asking her a whole bunch of questions about who she was and how she knew Chantel. And this woman wouldn't tell Carolyn who she was. She just said that she had gotten Carolyn's number from Chantel's phone. So this woman had to have been in the house not long at all after the group disappeared. And Carolyn assumed that it was the group's landlords. But when police spoke to the owners of the property, they denied having ever made this phone call. Now, something that came up during the investigation was that in the year following the group's disappearance, 
Three of Simon's followers ended their own lives, and two of these followers had travelled from Canada to Nanup to visit Simon a couple of years earlier. All three of these followers left notes clearly indicating that it had been Simon's teachings that had been their motivation for ending everything. And all three of them had used Nembutol, the same drug that Simon had mentioned in the group's plan to ascend together. But while going by the notes, two of the followers didn't seem to be unhappy or depressed in any way. Instead, They were excited to ascend to the next plane, but one of the notes left by a woman in the US called Christina Parrott read, this world has become too oppressive and dense for me. I can barely breathe sometimes. All I have sought and lived for is God's will and the opportunity to seek truth and serve others. I began to experience a withdrawal of any potential for this personality to serve at a spiritual level. This world has become so darkened and separated from the divine. I can no longer remain as an empty shell struggling each day to find purpose and guidance. I was barely functioning on several levels and felt that it was simply time to leave. So taking into account everything we've covered so far, in the years following the group's disappearance, the most favoured theory by police and the media and just the general public was that the group had followed through with this plan to end everything and ascend together. Like, that's clearly the direction we're headed in right now. But like I said at the beginning of this video, this case is still unsolved and this group ascension theory just leaves so many unanswered questions. Like if the plan really was to just wander off into the bush and end everything, why did Chantel and Tony sell their cars? Why did they cut off the utilities and clean up the house and pack up their personal belongings? Like surely if they truly believed that the plan was to leave this plane and ascend onto the next, all of these things would be just super low on their priority list and just the furthest things from their minds. And another thing, if Simon had ascended, Why on earth would he hide it? All three of these followers that we've spoken about left notes clearly explaining their motivations. So why then would Simon, as their religious leader, hide his ascension? Like surely he would want all of his followers to know. It would be a huge promo for his religion. So police are obviously asking themselves these questions as well. And they're also just finding more and more things during their investigation that have them wondering if maybe things aren't as clear cut as they first seem. For instance, if you'll remember Cookerman, the other Simon, Chantel's ex, in July of 2004, so years after he and Chantel had split up, He turned up at the group's home in Nanup and stirred up shit to the point where Chantel had to call the police and they advised her to get a violence restraining order against him or a VRO, which she did. And the very same month, Cookman violated this VRO and showed up at the house again. So Chantel called the police again. They came out and arrested Cookman and took him to Bunbury Hospital for psychiatric testing. It turns out on the way to the hospital, Cookman was talking the ear off the officer transporting him, all about Simon, about how the group was involved in a cult and Simon was their leader, but Simon was a total fake because his name wasn't even Simon, it was Gary. And this officer, Constable Taylor, his name was, he did really well. He, rather than just ignoring Cookerman's ramblings, he decided to follow up on them and he contacted the district office in Perth, but they told him that they had nothing on Simon. Simon had no criminal record in Australia, so there was nothing to verify what Cookerman Cookerman said or to justify questioning Simon about the whole thing. But Constable Taylor always remembered what Cookman had said, and he always meant to have just a casual chat with Simon about it all. But like I said, Simon was a total hermit when they were living in Nanup and always at home in front of his computer. And so Constable Taylor didn't run into Simon again until the 5th of May, 2007, when he pulled Simon over for speeding. And he recognized Simon instantly, even after all this time. And he took full advantage, asking Simon a whole bunch of questions about who he was and his background in the UK. And Simon was just instantly 
so nervous and so rattled and became like over nice and cooperative just to get out of there quickly and avoid any more questions. But you could tell he was really shaken up by the whole thing. And we don't know if it's a coincidence, but it was literally the very next day after Simon was pulled over that Chantel lodged that application for Leela's passport. And she stated in the application that they planned on traveling in the very next month. So was it possible that Simon was that spooked over the questions by Constable Taylor that he was worried he was going to be found out and the group really had planned on leaving the country and getting the hell out of Dodge before he was exposed as Gary Felton? Now, over the years, there has been just a ton of media coverage on the group's disappearance and the case was quite often referred to as the Doomsday Family Disappearance, which, of course, sparked a whole lot of attention from the public and there were tons of tips pouring in to the police, which you would think would be a good thing. What's frustrating is that because of all the media coverage, police just did not seem to take any of these tips very seriously and didn't really seem to look into any of them, citing lack of evidence. But years later, when these tips were followed up, a lot of them were found to be pretty solid and potentially legitimate. It turns out there were multiple sightings of the group reported in the months following their disappearance in different areas of WA, including places like Dunsborough, Albany and Perth. There were four separate reported sightings of the group just from Bustleton, where Chantelle had sold her car and the puppies. And one of these sightings came from a woman that had known Simon Chantelle and Leela for years in Nanup. And she said that in February 2008, Eight, so we're talking six months after the group disappeared, she saw a woman and a child walk into a shoe shop in town and she was certain that it was Chantel and Leela. She just didn't think much about it at the time because she didn't know they were missing until she saw the story in the news. It wouldn't be until 2013 though that police shared a breakthrough that they had made on the case that made them quite certain that not all members of the group were dead, that at least one of them had made a deliberate and quite possibly successful attempt to disappear. So on the 15th of July, 2007, the day after Chantel was last seen, a man traveling under the name Jay Roberts, but carrying Tony's phone, got onto a train from Bunbury to Perth and arrived at Perth train station at 5.15 that evening. From around 5.30 p.m., Tony's phone was used to make phone calls to a budget accommodation place called the Underground Backpackers Hostel in Northbridge, which I guess is what you would call Perth's downtown area, and also to a bar slash nightclub in the city called the Court Hotel. Tony's phone was also used that night to order a pizza to be delivered to a kind of secluded area of Kings Park, which is this big, huge park just outside of Perth City. And Tony's driver's license was also used as photo ID that night to check into a double room at the Underground Backpackers Hostel. This booking was supposed to be for two nights, but the next morning on the 16th of July, a man got into a taxi booked under the name Tony from the hostel to East Perth train station, where at 7.15 a.m., using a ticket once again booked under the name Jay Roberts, he hopped on a train and travelled all the way to Kalgoorlie. So police already knew Simon's history of stealing identities at this point, so you can bet they originally suspected that this Jay Roberts was Simon, posing as Tony, using his driver's licence and his phone, but looking at Jay Roberts' activities in Perth that night, they actually had more cause to believe that this man was Tony. Firstly, it was well known that that bar that Jay Roberts called that night, the Court Hotel, was LGBTQ plus friendly and Tony had been openly gay for decades, having come out to his parents way back in 1992. And that spot where the pizza was delivered that night in Kings Park was actually right by a toilet block that was a popular meetup spot for men 
men looking for gay sexual encounters. And Tony, in the month leading up to the group's disappearance, had actually been convicted and pled guilty to disorderly behavior for an incident down in Margaret River, where he had exposed himself in a public toilet to a plain clothed police officer. The pizza delivery man would also actually identify Tony as the man he had delivered the pizza to. And the pizza was delivered at night outside and apparently the identification took place years later under quote less than ideal circumstances but still everything was pointing towards this Jay Roberts actually being Tony. But Simon wasn't off the hook just yet because that same morning that Jay Roberts was at East Perth train station getting on a train to Kalgoorlie a second Jay Roberts was at Perth train station getting on a train to Bunbury to then catch a connecting bus to Northcliffe, which is ironically named because it's really at the very southern tip of WA. But what you'll also notice looking at a map is that it's pretty much in the opposite direction of Kalgoorlie. So now we had two Jay Roberts traveling on the same day on two different trains in two different directions. Interestingly, there had been another ticket to Northcliffe purchased once again under the name Jay Roberts a few days earlier, but this one had never been used. But the number provided for this booking was the group's landline in Nanab, and the name Roberts was the name of the street they lived on. Unfortunately, though, as mind blowing as these breakthroughs were, they never really led police anywhere or made it any clearer what happened to the group. If anything, it left them with more questions than answers. They were never able to confirm for sure that the J. Roberts staying in Perth that night on the 15th of July was Tony or if either of the J. Roberts that travelled the following day were Tony and or Simon. And if so, which one was which, who had gone to Kalgoorlie and who had gone to Northcliffe. In 2014, when police were finally going through all those reported sightings of the group, they ended up in Albany going through the records of a whole bunch of budget accommodation places. And they found a booking from February 2011 at this caravan park for a powered site for two people. And the booking was under the name Gary Felton. This Gary Felton had told the caravan park that he was a member of Top Tourists to get a discount on the booking, but when police then contacted the Top Tourist company, they told them that they had no members under that name. So police then went on to contact every single Gary Felton in Australia and ruled them all out as having been the man that checked into the caravan park that night in February 2011. But again, more questions questions than answers, right? Who was this man? If it was Simon, why did he check in using his real name, Gary? And seeing as the booking was for two people, who was that second person staying with him that night? Ten years after the group went missing in 2017, a three-day coronial inquiry was held to try and come to a conclusion as to what had happened to them, to go through all of the evidence and decide if any of the members of the group were still alive. One of the really big revelations that came to light during this inquiry was that on the 31st of October 2007, police had been called out to a remote bushland area near Northcliffe after prison workers had reported finding an old red woman's t-shirt and said that the area smelled of dead flesh. The officers that attended the site felt that the t-shirt had been there for years rather than months, but they took it for testing anyway, but before the forensic testing could be carried out, the t-shirt had been lost and no one knew what had happened to it. There's a bit of conflicting information here where the official police records show that no search was carried out of the area at the time, but the officers that attended the site said that they did have a look around, but they couldn't smell that dead flesh odour that the prison workers were talking about. The area was definitely searched in 2015 when they sent more police out to reinvestigate, but by this point in time, bushfires had 
swept through the area and nothing was ever found. It was also revealed that Simon, Chantel and Tony had all been prescribed medications that in large doses would be fatal, but going through Medicare records, there was no evidence found by investigators that any of them had been stockpiling these medications in the amounts necessary to kill a group of four people. When it came to the group's finances, like I said, Chantel's bank account had never been touched. Tony's bank account had also never been touched, but Chantel had been making withdrawals from her savings in the month leading up to the disappearance, totaling about $6,000. And Tony had been given about $25,000 by his parents to either settle a debt or just help him out, I guess. And this money has never been recovered. In the end, the ultimate outcome of this inquiry was that the coroner, Barry King, said that the evidence presented wasn't enough to convince him that any of the members of the group were still alive, but it also wasn't enough to convince him beyond a reasonable doubt that the members of the group were all dead, which does seem a bit anticlimactic, I know, but it's actually quite interesting because the favoured theory up until this point, and I think still to this day really, is that the group followed through with their group ascension pact. And so I think the general assumption was that the outcome of the inquiry was that they were all going to be legally declared dead. But there were multiple witnesses that got up at the inquiry, including including Simon's ex, Justine Smith, and the owners of the group's property in Nanup, and the overwhelming majority of them said that they believed that the group had voluntarily disappeared and that they were all still alive out there somewhere. Like the general consensus was that yes, Simon was more than a little bit creepy and he had an obvious hold on the group, but none of these witnesses believed that he was capable of killing Chantel, Tony, or Leela. Even the lead investigator, Senior Sergeant Greg Balfour, who has been on the case since 2013, said that he could strongly argue both theories, that the group was alive or that they were dead. And there doesn't seem to have been any real developments in the case since the 2017 inquiry. If Leela was still alive today, she would have just turned 20 years old just a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, though, the group's families are still in limbo. They have no idea what happened to Chantel, Tony, and Leela. If they're still alive, if they are, why they haven't reached out, they have no closure. We really love you both. We would love to just hear if you're okay um, and and safe and happy, Um, or if you need help, get some message to us and we could help you. That's always been our message. Come home. So now we have all of the information surrounding the group's disappearance. We're going to go through and kind of unpack all of the different theories surrounding what actually became of them. Starting, of course, with what I think is the most widely believed theory that the group followed through with this plan that Simon said they had to ascend together, most likely by wandering into the bush and taking fatal doses of the drug Nembutol. And I get why this is what most people believe happened. Before I started like intensely researching the case, it's what I believe happened because at first glance, it seems to tick the most boxes. You've got Simon's religious teachings. You've got the three followers of Simon's that all ended their lives in the months after the group's disappearance. There's the untouched bank accounts and the fact that Chantel and Tony have not reached out to their family in all of this time. We're talking 14 years. Why would Chantel cut off ties with her parents after refusing to do so for years unless she was actually dead? And Leela, she's a full-grown adult now who adored her grandparents. Why would she not reach out? So I definitely understand how people find this theory, you know, kind of the easiest to get behind, but it still leaves us with so many questions. Um, Firstly, if all of the members of the group were dead, 
then who was Jay Roberts? And this leads us to the next theory, the murder slash suicide theory. I mean, technically the first theory is also murder-suicide because it would have been murder to include the six-year-old Leila in this group ascension pact. But let's say that after Chantel and Leila had died, Simon and or Tony chickened out and decided to hide the bodies and flee the scene. Going by Jay Roberts' activities that night on the 15th of July in Perth, it really does seem like it was Tony, but the question I've been asking myself so many times is what if it was Simon? Simon was the one that knew how to disappear. Starting, of course, with stealing the real Simon's identity back in the 80s and fleeing the UK. But he also went on to disappear with Deborah, the mother of his son. And her family couldn't find her for months until they found them in this random ashram in India. Obviously, Simon also hightailed it back to the UK to lay low and hide from his publishers in Australia. But when he went back, to Australia, he told his ex, Justine Smith, to tell everyone that asked, including his own family, that he had gone to North America. So maybe Jay Roberts was Simon and he used Tony's driver's license and Tony's phone and doing things in Perth that he knew would throw people off the scent and make them think that it was Tony in the instance that they ever came after him. Like go to an LGBTQ plus friendly bar and getting that pizza delivered to that meetup spot in Kings Park, which honestly just strikes me as so strange, like getting a pizza delivered to a toilet block in Kings Park. Like we know Tony was brazen enough to expose himself to strangers in a toilet block from his escapades in Margaret River. Like we know that. Okay. But to get a pizza delivered, like that to me makes it seem like you want people to know that you're there. Like Simon knew about Tony's charges in Margaret River and wanted to make it look like Tony was repeating the behavior. Like it's just very strange. The next theory, of course, is that the group is all still alive and that they voluntarily disappeared. And I know I'm all over the shop on this case and I don't know where I stand, but I can actually more easily get behind this theory than I can the others. Because like I said, the things that the group did leading up to their disappearance just does not add up with the idea that they were planning on wandering into the bush and dying, you know, like selling their cars, cutting off the utilities, cleaning up the house. Like, why would you do all those things? And why get a passport for Leela and then be really secretive about this passport and not let her grandparents see it? Was it maybe because it was for Leela, but it didn't have her name on it? Maybe Simon had arranged forged passports for the group and this is why their names didn't come up on any immigration records if they really did travel to Brazil like they said they were going to. And even though Chantel and Tony's bank accounts were never touched, they had the money, you know, Chantel had the $6,000 that she had withdrawn from her savings and Tony had $25,000, definitely enough to set themselves up somewhere new. And what about all the sightings of the group around Western Australia? Maybe they only told people they were going to Brazil so that no one would ever look for them where they really ended up most likely not that far away from when they disappeared. Something I haven't mentioned yet but has really stuck with me is that along with all of the group's personal belongings that they packed up, like clothing and all of that, they also packed up all of their bedding, like all of their blankets and pillowcases and also their towels. Like, Surely you would not take these things with you unless you planned on using them somewhere else. But they're also very odd things to be taking internationally because they're so heavy and bulky and would take up so much of your luggage. Another thing that has stood out to me is a couple of hints here and there that the police believe if the group did voluntarily disappear that there were more people involved, namely more of Simon's followers. And the main thing that makes them believe this is records from Chantel's phone 
In the months leading up to her disappearance, there were three specific phone calls that were brought up at the Coronial Inquiry in 2017, and all of them are quite short. I think one of them was only five seconds long, and police have spoken to all of the people attached to the phone numbers involved, and all of them have denied having any knowledge or involvement with any members of the group. But one of these people, a man who was actually living in Kalgoorlie at the time, said that his phone was missing at the time that Chantel supposedly got this phone call from him. But he's been interviewed multiple times by police over the years because they found discrepancies in his story. And the five second phone call was from Chantel's phone to a landline in a suburb in Perth called Victoria Park. And when police spoke to the couple that was living at this house, at that time, they said, you know, I don't know, maybe it was a wrong number. But Chantel never followed up this call to a different but similar number, like you would expect if it had been a wrong phone number. Also, who was that angry woman that called Carolyn French after she bought the dogs off Chantel? And who was in that room that Chantel went into while she was there and then came out all anxious? Was it Simon or was it maybe another follower? What if one or both of the J. Roberts that traveled on the 16th of July weren't Simon or Tony, but instead other followers that were acting as red herrings to throw off the investigation into the group's disappearance? I could go on, but even though I can more easily get behind this theory, it still leaves the unanswered question of why has Chantel and Tony not reached out to their families? And if Simon is still alive, how has he not reared his ugly head again? Probably under a different name, but most likely in the same kind of online religious guru setting. Like he just comes off as way too narcissistic to be able to lay low all of this time and let the religion that he built from the ground up just Die. And this leads us to another theory that I haven't actually mentioned yet because it's a little bit crazy. It's a bit out there and most people just blow it off. But if it is true that the group voluntarily disappeared, it kind of answers these questions for us. So on the 17th of July, 2007, literally just days after the group disappeared, there was a domestic TAN Airlines flight in Brazil that landed in Sao Paulo airport and then veered off the runway and crashed into a fuel depot causing the plane to like instantly burst into flames and killing all 192 people on board. More than 70 of the bodies of these victims were so badly burned that they were never recovered or identified. Now, none of the group's names were on the manifest from this flight, but I mean, if they were on that flight, I would assume they would be traveling under false names. Otherwise, they would have come up on immigration records. Like I would be more surprised if their names were on that manifest. But after a joint investigation between Brazilian and Australian authorities, it was determined that none of the members of the group were on that flight. But how crazy, right? Like if the group did voluntarily disappear and then ended up on this flight, it explains why they never contacted their families, why their bank accounts were never touched and why no one ever saw them again. Like I said, authorities determined that the group definitely wasn't on that flight, but I mean, it just answers all of the questions, does it not? So let's finish up with a very quick final thoughts where I just basically tell you guys once again that I have no idea what happened to this group of people. Like Every time I think I've cracked the case, I remember a detail that just has me questioning everything all over again. And I'm back to square one. I guess if I have to choose, I mostly lean towards the idea that the group did voluntarily disappear, most likely not to Brazil. I think Simon got the idea for that story from the follower that tried to encourage him to join that other cult near the Amazon. And then the group told everyone this story so that that everyone would look for them in Brazil and not where they really ended up, which I feel like was most likely somewhere else in Western Australia. But then I always come back to why have Chantel and Tony not contacted their families in all of this time? That's why I can't 
fully commit to this theory and believe that they voluntarily disappeared. Thank you so much for spending this time with me. As usual, this hangout does not have to end here. We can just shuffle on down to the comments where you guys can give me your take on this case. Is there a theory that you can fully stand behind and commit to? And if so, how? Show your working. Like I'm dying to know how you don't have all of the thousands of questions that I have regarding this case. Or maybe like me, you're totally up in the air and have no idea what happened. Or maybe you have a theory that I haven't even touched on yet that I haven't even heard about. And if that is the case, please share it with us so that we can all discuss and consider it together. Before we finish up, as I mentioned, I had the pleasure of going on the amazing podcast, Girl Femme for Murder this week, and talk about Mary Kay Letourneau and Billy Falau, which was so out of my comfort zone and so nerve wracking, but luckily the hosts, Emily and Martin, are so lovely and it turned out to be a whole lot of fun. If you haven't already guessed from the name Dial Femme for Murder, Emily and Martin explore true crime, but tend to focus on cases where the main players are female or in some cases LGBTQ+. And they're seriously so easy to listen to. They're so funny and insightful. So if you like your true crime in podcast form, I can highly recommend them. You can find Dial Femme for Murder wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. I will leave links in the description down below. Lily is just sitting here staring awkwardly at me. I'm pretty sure she wants to say bye. Hey. I know it's confusing, but they're just there. Just there. Not here. There. Not here. There. You guys, my loves, my besties, thank you so much for spending this time with me and Lily today. We really appreciate it as always. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, remember to give it a thumbs up below. And if you're not already subscribed, just, you know, take the plunge and join this big best friendship we have going on here. And remember to hit the bell so that you don't miss out on any fun hangout dates like this one. Me and Lily hope you have a wonderful week and we will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Bye.